Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thanks for this evening. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your love, your provision, your care. Thank you that you made a way for us to be in community with you. And um, thank you for the beauty of the offering and the sacrifice that um, that you did so that we could just talk to you and hang out with you and spend time worshiping you and praising your name and praying and talking to you and be able to know that you hear us and that you love us and that you care and provide for us and that you call us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. For several years, I worked uh, for the mission agency of the Christian Reformed Church in North America, and I'd make lots of trips to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and um, to the headquarters there, and we'd have meetings, and we'd discuss planting churches and all kinds of missional-type things. And, and, um, and one day, um, you know, even then, my hair was long and going white and uh, beard and... and uh, and I was kind of the oddball. And um, because if you've been to West Michigan, you know they're kind of, you know, they wear suits a lot and they, and they um, dress nice and they have business cut haircuts. And, and so I would stride in there dressed much like this and uh, we would talk and I would come up with all these bizarre ideas and challenge things they said and so one day, uh, the director of, of the agency itself um, said to me, Rod, you make us all nervous. And I said, well, why is that? And he says, because A, you're huge, and B, you come storming in out of the desert and you yell at us for three days, and then you go home. And then we go, oh, you know, and the whole time we're feeling kind of bad about ourselves and we're feeling like we should be doing more and we should do something differently. And we kind of, and then, and you just say, you should be, we should do this and we should do this. And then you turn around and go home. And then we relax and go, oh, thank God, he's gone. Uh, now we can get back to normal, right? And then four months later, five months later, or six months later, we have another meeting and you come storming in and you yell at us and you holler at us and you tell us we're all messed up and, and tell us what we should be doing and, and then we feel bad about ourselves and, oh, and, and, then we, and then we go, oh, good, he's gone. And he says, the, you're like, and he says, you even look like one of those Old Testament prophets out in the desert with a big beard and, the, and, the, and wearing... Fl- Charlton Heston, right? Wearing flip flops and being being the crazy man. Um, I did not eat locusts, so there's that. Um, but that's kind of the idea that if I say the word prophet, that's kind of the idea that that some of us have of of what a prophet is. This this sort of strange creature who yells at you, makes you feel bad. If you've read scripture. You read the Old Testament, and, and you see a lot of these prophets, and they, um, and they yell at people, and they do stuff, and, um, and people feel bad, and then the prophet goes away. That, um, that's kind of not what... Um, we're talking about, however, when we talk about prophets. We're going to be spending the next few weeks looking at three primary identities of Jesus. We're seeing Jesus as prophet, um, and we're seeing Jesus as a priest, and we're seeing Jesus as a king. These are, these are like um, statuses that he has, uh, identities that he has, and they're identities that we share because we're in Christ, we too share those identities. We are, we have, we carry the identity of prophet, of priest, and of king. And tonight we're exploring the idea of prophet, and then we're going to be talking about priest next week and king after that. And, and we're going to see who Jesus is in that, and then what the big plan was, what it's all about. Um, One of the questions I, I have uh, for you is, how do, how do you hear 
from God? It's a question I have asked a million times of a million different people in my life. I love asking that question. And part of the reason for asking that question is because I wonder sometimes how I hear from God. How, How do I hear from God? How do you hear from God? How do you know when God's telling you to do something? Anybody want to shout out something? How do you hear from God? So hearing through other people, hearing, uh, having doors open that were maybe closed, um, a kind of a path being made known. Anyone else? Sure. So scripture, scripture comes to mind and we, oh yeah, that's probably what I should be doing. That's a great way to hear from God. Ron. So kind of a stability in the midst of chaos, all of a sudden things work out, okay? Right, afterwards it's easy to look back, a little easier to look back. Exactly right. Anyone else? Yes. Sure. I, I'm always fascinated with these answers. I really am. The because um, I've I've heard a lot of them. The answers are all over the map, right? Some some of us, um, you know. I just read my Bible, and God, you know, I open the Bible to, and a verse pops out at me, and it tells me what it is I need to know, or. Or somehow I just know because I hear a voice in my head or um, I go up to Mount Lemmon and get in touch with nature for a while and let all the other stuff go away and, and uh, I hear God, I discern. <clears throat> I, I ask my pastor and then I do exactly what he tells me to do. <laughs> okay, nobody ever, <laughs> nobody ever does that. That's not how people hear from God. Um, um, although they could. Um, discerning God's voice matters deeply to us. It really does. It, it, it's something that we need. We want to hear God speak, and we want him to be very clear with us. Uh, don't you hate kind of the mystery of not knowing, right? Where we, we struggle with not knowing. And then for the big questions of life, we, we want clarity. Should I marry this person or not? Should I apply for this job or that job? Um, what does the future hold? Um, mostly when we're asking what does the future hold, we're saying, I want to know the future, but but really only if it's good, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't want any of the bad news stuff. If it's bad news, surprise me. I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, oh, we're going to run these tests, and you kind of go, ooh, uh, hope it works out okay. When we often hear the word prophecy, we also often or most often think immediately about foretelling, telling the future, fortune telling, predicting the future. The biblical view of prophecy is about speaking truth, speaking God's truth. It's speaking God's word. A part of that may include predicting future events because sometimes God tells us stuff that will happen um, that was certainly true of the Old Testament prophets. He predicted on occasion 
They predicted what would happen. But for the most part, it's telling what's happening, bringing God's word to bear in the current setting that we're living in. Um, It's telling the truth into circumstances that we're in right now. I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with truth, with the truth. I often make a big show of wanting to be told the truth, but what what I really want is something that's sweet-sounding, and even if it's a lie, I kind of prefer that. I, I was in California this week, and I connected with some old friends um, we were on a committee together for years, and, and so we just decided to get an Airbnb in San Diego, and we hung out for a couple of days, and, and it was just a beautiful time of reconnecting with some friends, common mission. And when we sat down for that first meal, we were kind of going around, so how's everybody doing? And... Oh, man, we're, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You've been in those kind of meetings, right? Oh, yeah, man, I'm doing good. Life is good. Well, I had gotten up at 2 o'clock in the stinking morning to drive over there to San Diego, and then I had gone to the airport at 9 o'clock and picked up the first guy and then picked up a couple other guys. Then we spent the afternoon at a baseball game because somebody got the harebrained idea that we should go to the ball game, and so we did, and then... Uh, we went back to the beach and walked around for a little while, and then we were out to eat, and now we're eating. And I've been up since 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's, you know, 9 o'clock at night. I'm exhausted. My back's killing me. My neck is stiff and sore from sitting in the Jeep for all that time. And, and my bad ankle is so stinking sore I can hardly walk because I've been going up and down the stairs at the stadium and everywhere else. And what I really wanted to do was just take a nap, right? Um, I, so I'm, but I'm saying, yeah, I'm okay, because I'm not a truth teller in that situation. And we kind of go, and we do that. It's kind of a social nicety, right? Because really nobody wants to hear me complain. You don't want to hear me complain. It's like, eh, whatever. That's what you get for being old and driving across the desert. Get over it. But prophecy is always about truth-telling. It's always about telling God's truth. And it's always about speaking the truth in love. It's always about speaking truth. And it's always about sin. Sin is an affront to God. Sin is that which stands against God. And it must be dealt with. And God will always deal with it. That was his purpose. That's his purpose in sending Jesus. That's his purpose from the very beginning. At the beginning, Adam and Eve disobey God and they mess up their relationship that they have with him. They've been having this beautiful intimacy with God, this amazing time where where they're in this garden and they're with God and he comes and walks with them in the evenings and they delight in each other and they hang out with each other and it's not like crossing the desert to go to San Diego. It's just about being on the beach with the waves lapping. That's It's perfect for them. And then they mess it up. They sin. And suddenly there's separation. Suddenly there's distance. Eric talked this morning about this fragmentation that happened. There's this, now it's not together. There's not wholeness. There's separation. And life isn't working anymore. They find themselves outside the garden. Genesis 3 then records God's voice. It's his promise. Genesis 3.15 says, God is, is... talking about Satan, and he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, Satan and Eve, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God is already promising, making a prophetic promise that he's going to take care of this sin problem. He's going to take care of this distance that's happened, this separation that's happened. He's going to do it. God is going to crush evil. He's going to destroy it. And even though for a season sin will have great influence in this world, God promises that it will end. 
every effort of God is to restore our relationship with him, the relationship that's been broken by sin, Adam and Eve's sin and our sin. So out of that, God begins to call and form his people. He calls people to follow him. He forms the people of Israel into his people. They become his people. Those first books of the Bible are God calling these great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. He calls them to come follow him. And he forms this great people of Israel. And then he sends them this prophet, this great prophet, the prophet Moses, to give his people the rules of how they should live. God doesn't leave them alone. He will deal with sin. God gives us boundaries. The Ten Commandments are these beautiful boundaries that we live within and are called to live within. And you say, well, yeah, Moses went up on this mountain and he wrote down the Ten Commandments and we've all seen the guy, you know, holding the, the tablets and coming down and, and <clears throat> it's great. Um, and it's like Moses wrote those down. He, he, but he's just the scribe. He's, he's just the, the one, he's the secretary. He's God's secretary. God, Exodus 20 verse 1 says, God spoke all these words. God spoke every word of the Ten Commandments. They were given to us, to him, to the people of Israel. Laws and rules to keep. But of course we don't. They don't. The people don't. They disobey and they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years and and they can't get it right. Because something in us, we're incapable of living according to God's rules. We just can't do it. That original sin and our sin just combines to just destroy us. And destroy what ought to be. And God tries over and over again to call us back to what it is that we ought to do and what we ought to be. All through the Old Testament, God sends prophets. The whole latter part of the Old Testament is all about prophets. We, many of them write books, but they're also mentioned. We have, we have them listed. You can just go book after book. And, and it's really interesting because all of them deal with our separation from God. What do people do? What do the people do then? Because we're the same. One of the things that they did was they ignored God. They treated God as if he didn't exist. God didn't matter. They just did their own thing. Ignoring God. It's what we do. I don't want to do what God calls me to do. I want to do what I want to do. I don't like the idea of being controlled. I don't like the idea of being told what to do. When my kids were little, they would argue with me. And, and one day Derek said to me, Dad, I don't know why you think you're the boss. <laughs> Neither do I, but I am, right? <laughs> and, and, and so... I don't know why you think you're the boss. And that's kind of how we are with God. And so he freely went and ignored my warnings and um, suffered the consequences. So we ignore God. The other thing is we do is we worship other gods. We go find other gods. Gods that, that we like better. Gods that will appease us. Gods that, that will bend to our will. We make up gods um, that we worship. Things that we worship people that we worship, idols that we set out and say, this is what I'm going to worship instead of the true God, because the true God, uh, it's just too hard. Because if I have to deal with the true God, I have to deal with my sin. I have to deal with the fact that I missed the mark. I have to deal with the fact that things are not the way it's supposed to be, and I don't want to do that. So this other God makes me feel good about myself. We're also defiant before God. 
You can't tell me what to do. I have rights. But God is our creator and we don't have rights. (laughs) We have privileges that God grants us. We do that and God sends prophets. Prophets to warn. He sends prophets to warn the Old Testament people of Israel and he sends prophets to us. So what do the prophets do? One of the cool things that prophets do is if you read the Old Testament, you read that prophets weep. They cry a lot. They're sad. They look at the sin around them and they go, ugh, this is horrible. Matter of fact, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because it's all he does. He just cries all the time. He's just sad all the time. Do you ever get that? Do you ever look around you and just you're just sad about the sin in this world, the struggle in this world? Prophets get depressed and discouraged. They can't see a way out. They can't see, they, they know that people are just not going to do what they're supposed to do. Prophets get angry towards sin. They, get, they rage against it. Prophets warn of the consequences of sin. If you do this, this is going to happen. But prophets also commiserate. See the prophet Hosea, and he was asked to go and marry a a woman who slept with other men, and then when when they were divorced, he had to call her back and marry her again and love her. Prophets call people back to truth, call people back to God. And by the way, prophets suffer. And Jesus comes as a prophet. We have this long line of prophets in the Old Testament, and then we have the New Testament prophet. The first one is John the Baptist, and he comes and he says, I'm not the one, but the one who comes after me is the one. Jesus comes as a prophet. He comes with compassion and love and tenderness. He comes to save us. He is God's answer to sin. Did you hear the passage when Karen read it? Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus." Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago through the holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, All the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, therefore your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. That was the whole point. (laughs) That was the whole plan. That was God's plan from the beginning, to send Jesus, to send the one. Clear back in Exodus, thousands of years before, God had made it clear, this is the plan. This is the plan. 
And you know who got messed up by it is Satan, right? Because Satan thought, I've, tr- I've messed God up. I, I've messed with his people. I have control. I have power. I have position. I have status. I can do good. I can do what I want to do. He was the rebellious Derek yelling at me going, who made you the boss? <coughs> and then God has this plan, this upside down kingdom plan of sending Jesus to be the prophet. Do you know that Jesus weeps for you? That he's sad? That he sees what you go through? That he's with you in that? Do you know that Jesus hates sin? Hates your defiance? But loves you? Do you know that Jesus warns you of consequences? We, we often think of, of the, we, or we don't think of the consequences of our actions, and then when we suffer them, we've, we feel like, ah, it's, God hates me. <laughs> no. He warns us. He tells us uh, consequences. You, you keep messing around with, with uh, things you ought not to mess around with, with drugs, with, with your struggles with pornography, with your ideas of, of I get to do what I want to do. There are consequences to all those things, real consequences. And Jesus warns us, don't sin. Don't do that. We sing the song, my oh my, oh, please don't. Prophets commiserate. Do you know that Jesus understands everything that we go through? He was tempted just like we are tempted. He commiserates with us. He understands us. He gets it. He's not just some God who's off distant who doesn't, yeah, well, shoot, if I was God, I wouldn't have to sin either. How hard would that be, right? No. He commiserates. He knows our struggles. And he calls us back to him over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps calling back. Every time we put distance between ourselves and God, he calls us back. That's what, that's what a prophet does. A prophet calls us to repent. A, a, a repentance is simply going one way and then you turn and go the other way. You're going this way that leads to death, and God says, no, stop, and you turn around and you go, oh, and you turn around and you walk towards life. But here's the trick. Have you noticed, and maybe maybe you don't, but one of the things I've noticed in, in my very particular sins is when I'm walking in the sinful status and, and I'm trying to find life somewhere where God isn't, and then... Uh, someone warns me or I feel the call to, to repent and to turn around, and I turn around. Have you ever noticed how close God is? <laughs> well, like he's been tracking with me. He's been following me. He's, he's never far away. We, we think God is distant. No, we're the ones who turn their back on him. We're the ones who create the distance. And Jesus closes that. There's no distance And he calls us back, and he calls us to repentance. And Jesus suffered. He comes as the perfect prophet, and he suffers. He suffers an agonizing, horrible death. We just celebrated Easter. It was so cool to be here to see baptisms and to see life bubbling up, to see people committing to follow Jesus with their whole heart such a joy but that came at a cost a tremendous a cost and the, and the cost was was that Jesus himself had to suffer completely abandoned by everyone no one is with him on that cross he is there by himself and even god the father turns his back on the son When Jesus was here, he said in John 8, 28 and 29, 
when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. I always do what pleases him. Are you a prophet? Yes, you are. You look around and you say to each other, I see the sin in your life. I see the struggle in your life. I love you. I have compassion. I don't want you to suffer. We warn people of the consequences. We are like Jesus in that. We speak truth to people. That's what the essence of prophecy is, speaking the truth to each other. Don't be judgmental. Don't be harsh. Don't be angry. Don't be nasty. If any of those things are true, it's probably not really the truth. It's some other thing. It's not from God. When God speaks to us, it's with compassion and tenderness and love. So when you see each other here and in the village and in the community around you and you see the struggle, you go, please, please turn from that. Turn from that. And then we walk with each other. There's a warning about prophets who don't speak the truth. In the Old Testament, they were stoned to death. So, you know, let's not go there. But... But it was so important, if you're going to say, I'm speaking for God, you darn well better be speaking for God. It better be the truth you're telling. And the best way to tell the truth to each other is not use your words. Use God's words. Use the scripture. We've been given that. And if you're guessing, just say, you know, I don't know what God's saying, but here's a guess, here's some ideas that I have. But if you say, you know what? What you're doing is wrong. It's evil. Your rage and anger against your spouse is not something that God says, yep, that's fine. I I agree. You should do that. No. That's not how it works. Speak the truth in love. Speak God's word to each other as Jesus speaks truth to you. 